Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Price, and I just wanted to say a quick welcome to WestFest 2021. We're really glad that this program could be a part of our suite of programs this week. And if you're new to WestFest, it is the Ohio State University's annual celebration of science, sustainability, sustainability, engineering, and outreach. It started today, and we have 25 wonderful live programs scheduled from now through Saturday, as well as a suite of pre-recorded uh, Watch Anytime content available on our website. Please feel free to check out our website at go.osu.edu forward slash Westfest. And if you choose to share on social media during our event this week, please use the hashtag OSU Westfest. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Gowdy for today's program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I share my slides. All right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Scott Gowdy. I'm a professor of astronomy here at Ohio State University, uh, Thomas Jefferson Chair for Space Exploration. Um, I am also a JPL Distinguished Visiting Scientist, and I'm happy to, here, to be here today to talk to you about the uh, hunt for other worlds and life in the universe. So before the pandemic, at least, I used to spend a lot of time on airplanes. Uh, this is very common for a professional astronomer. And occasionally, uh, the person next to me would try to strike up a conversation. Um, and usually, they would lead off by asking what I did for a living. So if I didn't feel like talking, uh, I would tell them I'm a physicist. And usually, the conversation ended there. But if I did feel like talking, I would tell them I'm an astronomer. And oftentimes they were, eyes would light up and, and they would tell, tell me, you know, I wanted to be an astronomer when I was young, but the math was too difficult or my parents told me I should be a doctor instead or something like that. But inevitably as the conversation progresses, at some point, um, every person asks me the same question. And it's probably a question that you might ask me if you were sitting next to me on a plane and found out I was an astronomer, which is, um, are we alone? Is there life in the universe? <clears throat> and so my usual response to this is, I don't know. Um, because I don't, uh, and that's uh, usually not, uh, that doesn't go over very well because think, people think I'm some sort of higher authority on this question, I'm not. Um, they're like, yeah, 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 but what do you think? I said, well, I don't know, but I'm trying to find out. And so what I'm gonna talk to you today about is what I and other astronomers around the world are trying to do to answer this question of, are we alone? Now that question itself is actually quite complicated. Um, and so as astronomers and scientists, we break it down into smaller questions that are more easily answered. Um, and so the first question we can ask is, are there planets orbiting other stars at all? Um, and up until about 25 years ago, uh, we didn't actually know the answer to this question. A little bit more than that, more like 30 years ago, we didn't know the answer to this question. So we first wanna see, are there planets around orbiting other stars? And if there are, then we can ask, do any of those planetary systems look like our own solar system? Um, by which we mean sort of four big glorified balls of rock um, and iron located in the inner part of the planetary system. Then, then large gas giants composed of mostly hydrogen and helium in the outer parts of planetary systems. And if there are solar systems like ours, then we can ask, well, do any of those host a planet like the Earth? By which I mean a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, the right distance from its parent star that it might have liquid water and therefore potentially might be habitable. <clears throat> and if the answer to that question is yes, then we can ask, well, do any of those planets happen to host life? And so that's the way we break down this, this problem into uh, more digestible pieces. Um, and like I said, uh, just 30 years ago, we didn't know the answer to any of these questions. And one remarkable uh, thing that I'd like you to take away from this talk is now just you know, th 30 years into this scientific endeavor, we actually have pretty good answers for three out of four of these questions. And we are on the cusp of being, answer being able to answer the fourth. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I and other astronomers are going about answering these questions. So first, I want to just briefly review the, re review the tools we have in our toolbox to detect planets. Planets are actually quite hard to detect, and that's because they're very low mass or very faint. They're very, very diminutive compared to their host stars. But we have a variety of tools that we've developed over the um, past few decades that enable us to detect planets. One is called the Doppler method. And so here you have the planet orbiting the star. And the star, um, or at least that's what we're told, is planets orbit stars, but that's not actually true. Planets orbit the center of mass of the planet star system. So that means as the planet orbits the star, 
or the center of mass. The star orbits the center of his mass as well, albeit in a much smaller orbit. So that means that if you look up in the sky and you imagine all those stars have planets, um, those stars are actually wobbling both in the plane of the sky and along your line of sight. If they wobble along your line of sight, then they're actually being Doppler shifted in the same way that radar is used to measure your speed of a car. And so you can measure the speed of that star as it moves back and forth along your line of sight. And by measuring that speed and the period of that, you can determine if there's a planet orbiting that star. You can also do this by measuring the wobble in the plane of the sky. And so again, if you imagine looking up at the stars and they're all orbited by planets, all those stars are undergoing little wobbles due to their planets orbiting them. Now those wobbles are too small for your eye to see, but with sophisticated instruments, we can detect these wobbles and again, infer the existence of planets. The other ways we can uh, detect planets is if a planet actually happens to have the right orientation that its plane is along your line of sight, then that planet will pass in front of its parent star once every orbit. And when it does that, it casts a shadow on the star. And so then we can use that to infer the, the slight dimming of periodic dimming of the star to infer that it has a planet orbiting it. There's another technique called microlensing, which I'll talk about a little bit more detail later, um, but it uses the gravity of the planet to detect planets. And then the simplest technique is just direct imaging. Here you're just actually imaging the planet as it is resolved from its parent star. And this is one of the most famous direct imaging uh, planetary systems known that has four giant planets orbiting the star. This is a time-lapse um, image set of images where you can see the planets actually orbiting the star. The star here is being suppressed because it's very bright. So you don't actually see the starlight here. So those are the main tools that we have. There are other uh, methods, which I, I just lumped here as everything else. Uh, but these are the five main tools we have at our disposal. And each one has its uh, pros and cons, its weaknesses and strengths. And so by combining all these, we can get a more complete sense of planets out there. So um, up until, like I said, about 30 years ago, this was the one planetary system that we knew of around um, a, a normal star. Of course, this is our own solar system. And I've done some revisionist history here and removed Pluto. Now, as I mentioned, our uh, solar system has a very unique structure to it, architecture to it. It has these four glorified balls of iron silicates, rock, sitting in very close to the, to the sun. Um, that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then right smack dab in the middle of the planetary of our solar system is Jupiter, which is about a thousand times more massive or less massive than the sun um, and, uh, and about 10,000 times more massive than the earth, or sorry, 300 times more massive than the earth. It's made of primar primarily hydrogen and helium. So it's a big ball of gas. Saturn is a slightly smaller version of Jupiter located uh, about 10 times the distance of the earth from the sun. And then you, as you go out, you encounter Uranus and Neptune, which are uh, composed of a lot of hydrogen, helium, but a, a bit more rock and ice than Jupiter and Saturn. So this is a very interesting architecture for our solar system. And given you know hundreds of years of thinking about why our solar system looked like this, we were not surprisingly able to come up with a nice theory that explained why our solar system should look like this. And, um, and being the kind of unimaginative scientists that we were, we uh, suppose that all planetary systems probably look like this. We couldn't have been more wrong. So in 1995, the planetary companion to 51 Pegasi was discovered. Um, and uh, this is often thought of as the first exoplanet discovered, but it's actually not true. And if you want to ask me about this in the questions, I can tell you a little bit about the prehistory of before 51 Peg B. But this was a planet found by the Doppler method. Again, we're measuring the, uh, the movement of the star back and forth along your line of sight using Doppler, um, uh, the Doppler uh, uh, shift. And here, um, the planet that was discovered, 51 Peg B, is a Jupiter-like planet. It has a mass of roughly half that of Jupiter. But rather than being, than being located in the middle of its planetary system, like our own Jupiter, it's located only about 10 stellar radii from its parent star. So well inside the orbit of Mercury if it was in our solar system. And of course, our theories did not predict that this planet should be there. In fact, our theories predicted that, that planet, a planet like this shouldn't be there. And so this caused all sorts of consternation. People didn't think it was a real planet, but it's fact a real planet. Um, and it just shows that our theories for planet formation were woefully incomplete. And this is actually a very common theme, which I'll talk about here in a second. So since then, um, and that, that discovery uh, recently was awarded the Nobel Prize. So Michel Mayor and Didier Queloz, uh, two Swiss astronomers, were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of 51 Peg B that really jump-started this field 
of exoplanets. And since then, there's been an enormous increase in the number of planets that we know about, not just using the Doppler method, which was used to find 51 peg B, but all those other methods that I mentioned as well. And this plot just shows the cumulative number of exoplanets. So the total number of exoplanets known as a function of the year is a little outdated, but the, this trend continues. And you can see that um, the straight line here is basically an exponential increase. In other words, the number of planets we know about doubles roughly every two years. Um, and this, like I said, this trend has continued. We now know of almost 4,500 exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars, and they span a wide range of planet masses, um, radii, a span a wide range of stellar host types, not just stars like the sun, um, and all sorts of different or orbital architectures. So, um, so the, we now know the answer to this first question, are there planets orbiting other stars? The answer is emphatically yes. And in fact, it seems like every time we turn over a rock, we find a new exoplanet. Um, and so check that box. And in fact, um, what we've learned is that mother nature is far more imaginative than we are. The range of exoplanets that are out there far exceeds what we initially um, expected. Um, so what about planetary systems like ours? Um, well, that, um, the techniques that were originally developed to find planets, in particular the Doppler and transit technique, are not sensitive to Jupiter and Saturn type planets because they're located too far away from their parent stars. So we had to in, uh, develop a new method to find planets um, like that, like Jupiter and Saturn orbiting other stars. Uh, and this is actually part of my thesis was to help develop this method um, as a graduate student here at Ohio State. Um, and this technique is, is relatively simple. So if you imagine staring at a star in the center of our galaxy for long enough, um, then eventually another star will pass close to your line of sight to that background star, a foreground star. Now that foreground star has mass and that mass will actually bend the light. So you can see that here, splitting it into multiple images. Now those multiple images, so, so you can imagine that as stars pass each other along the line of sight, um, that stars are being split into multiple uh, images, which is kind of a fascinating idea. Now, in fact, those images are separated by an uh, angle that is way too small for our, our eyes to see. In fact, even too small for our most sophisticated telescopes to see, except in a few uh, rare circumstances. But the background star is actually magnified by this foreground star. So this foreground star's gravity acts like a magnifying lens, making the background star um, get brighter for a short period of time. And so as the planet star, the, the star comes into alignment with the background star, the background star gets brighter. And as it goes away from alignment, it gets fainter. Now, if this foreground star happens to have a planet as shown here in this cartoon, and that, pla that planet has mass, so it acts like a magnifying glass as well. And so you get an extra little uh, magnification on top of the magnification caused by your star. And that uh, indicates that this planet is being orbited by a star. And just to show you, so this, this, the phenomena was predicted by Einstein, although he famously said it would never be observed, microlensing. In the early 1990s, uh, it was developed as an exoplanet detection technique by my, um, my advisor, uh, invented by my advisor and a few other people. And then as a graduate student, I worked with my advisor to help develop it into a viable detection technique. Um, and uh, just to show you that this, this crazy idea isn't just made up, this is the first planet ever detected by microlensing or a cartoon of it. This is a background image. You can see the star get brighter as the foreground star comes into alignment. And then it temporarily gets much brighter. And that's due to the extra little boost of magnification you get from the planet. Okay, so we've now detected over a hundred planets with this technique. Um, and the one that um, I am uh, most fond of because I, I led this discovery, uh, I was a postdoc uh, at, the, at Harvard. Um, and we were um, monitoring a star that was getting brighter. We, and so we, therefore we thought it was being lensed, microlensed by a foreground star. So this was an excellent opportunity to see if we saw a little extra brightening due to a planet. And so um, this all happens in real time. We don't know when these perturbations are gonna happen. So we have to keep on taking data and analyze it real time so that we can adjust our observing strategy to make sure we catch these extra little brightnesses. And so we saw this background star getting brighter and brighter. And I was in what's called home base, which means I was in charge of coordinating all the observations of this microlensing event. And that's a 24 hour job. So for a week, you basically don't sleep. 
Um, and so I was up at like midnight uh, um, one night uh, coordinating these observations. And um, right around then we saw additional observations come in that showed the star get much brighter unexpectedly. And that was due to a planet. And so I quickly modeled this and I said that this was a Saturn mass planet. So I sent an email to all of our uh, collaborators saying we discovered a Saturn mass planet. And then I predicted the future behavior. And I said that the next night the, the star would be very faint. It would be down here. Uh, and so that was to help the observers plan their, their exposure times and how to take the observations. So I went to bed and you know I was feeling quite proud of myself and very happy that we'd found a planet. Uh, and after a few hours of sleep, I woke up because I knew new data had come in and I wanted to make sure that my prediction had been validated. So the new data came in and rather than be down here, the, the brightness be down there, it was actually almost as bright as it was when I went to bed, which was completely in contradiction to my model. So I was super despondent. I was questioning my career choice as an astronomer. But meanwhile, the, the, the star went ahead and did what it did. Um, and the rest of my model more or less turned out to be correct. So uh, it took me a long time to figure out what was going on, but it turns out that there's not just one planet in this system, there's two planets in the system. And it's that second planet that caused this extra, extra brightening that I was not predicting. And if we look at the properties of these two planets, they have bear remarkable similarities to our own Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and and they they're both have masses, the masses ratio between the, the, the Jupiter mass planet and the star and the Saturn mass planet and the star are very similar to Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and the separation ratios are also very similar. So um, this planet is about half the distance of Jupiter from the sun. This planet is about half the distance of Saturn from the sun. And they're both orbiting a star that's about half the mass of the sun. So it's as if you took the uh, sun, Jupiter, Saturn system and scaled it down by a factor of two. Um, so this discovery uh, and we can use this discovery to estimate how common such systems are. And we had came up with a very rough number of about 17% with very large uncertainties. But what this argued is that planetary systems, at least those like our own Jupiter and Saturn, were not, not rare. Um, and so indeed there are other solar systems like ours and we're currently working on refining that. So, um, so that was back in 2008. Um, so we'd, by that point, we'd already answered basically the first two of these questions. Yes, there are planets orbiting other stars and yes, some of them look like our own solar system. Now, the third question, you know, are there planets that look like the Earth? That one is a lot harder to, uh, to answer. And that's because the Earth is very small compared to the sun. It has a, um, it has a radius that's about 1% the radius of the sun, um, size 1% the radius of the size of the sun, a mass that's about 1 100,000th or 300,000th the mass of the sun. Um, and uh, it's located at a relatively large distance from the star. So the techniques of the uh, ground-based techniques of, of Doppler, uh, uh, Doppler radio velocity uh, detection and transit detection don't work. In fact, you have to go to space and you have to use the transit technique in space. Um, and that's exactly what the Kepler Space Telescope was designed to do. And uh, a, a planet, an Earth-like planet transiting a sun-like star uh, that uh, transit has a depth of one part in 10,000, so 0.01%. So you see the star get dimmer by 0.01%. It lasts for about 10 hours out of a, a year. Um, and it only happens for about 0.1% of stars, even if every single star has an Earth-like planet, which they don't. So this is a very difficult experiment. You have to monitor hundreds of thousands of stars continuously for timescales of years without blinking. And that's exactly what Kepler was designed to do. Um, and in the process, Kepler found a number of, uh, found many thousands of planets, the most productive uh, exoplanet survey ever. Um, and so this just shows a sort of gallery of cartoons of the star, and then you can see the planet shadow in front of the star. Um, and you see a very wide range of star sizes, um, planet sizes, and you can see many of these often have multiple planets transiting in front of their star as well. But, um, Several interesting results came from Kepler. One is that small planets, planets with sizes less than roughly that of Neptune, are the most common kinds of planets in the solar system. Um, so giant planets are much rarer, but these smaller planets, in particular planets like the Earth, are much more common. Maybe 20% of all stars have these smaller planets in relatively short orbits. But most excitingly, Kepler actually found a number of planets that had uh, properties that were similar to that of the Earth. We would call these Earth analogs. So that means these are planets that are, uh, sizes are consistent with being rocky, 
Um, and they could have an atmosphere, although we don't know in most cases if they do, but they're located the right distance from their parent star that if they have an atmosphere, they could have liquid water oceans. And since we know liquid water is a, one of the requirements for all life on Earth, this means they could potentially be habitable. And this just shows a gallery of, of, of um, artists' um, uh, depictions of what these planets might look like. Most of these were found by Kepler, although not all of them. Um, and there's a few of them you may have heard about, like TRAPPIST-1 uh, has uh, at least three planets that are potentially habitable. Um, uh, Proxima Sen, which is the nearest star to the sun, has a planet that might also be habitable. So we now know that planets like the Earth are actually out there and are not too uncommon. So again, and, and this, this result has been around for about five or maybe five to 10 years, depending on, on uh, who you ask. Um, and so this means that um, now, you know, just 20 years after the first exoplanets were discovered, we know that yes, exoplanets exist. Yes, some of them look like our own solar system. And yes, planets like the Earth also exist out there. And so now we're ready to take on the next step, which is actually searching for life around these uh, potentially habitable planets. First seeing if they are actually habitable and then looking for signatures of life. Now, this turns out to be an enormously challenging problem. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll explain sort of why here in a second. But um, despite that, astronomers have developed, developed two different techniques for, uh, for uh, to enable us to study the atmospheres of planets, see if they have the conditions necessary for life, and then look for signatures of life, which we call biosignatures. Um, and these divide up depending on your, if you're looking at low mass stars with mass roughly one tenth to a half the mass of the sun or stars that have masses similar to that of the sun. Um, so there's two paths you can go by. Um, and I call the, like to call these, these paths the, um, the uh, small black shadows, which is shown here on the right, um, and this here, you're using the transit technique to study the atmosphere of the planet, which I'll describe how that works in a second, and pale blue dots. Here, you're actually imaging the planet in reflected light, resolved from its host star, and looking for signatures of the atmosphere in the spectrum of the planet. Okay, so our first, the first path that we're going to tackle is this small black shadows path. And this is happening very, is happening now and is about to come into its own. So this is this sort of low hanging fruit of this method. Um, and the idea here is if you look at a star and you have the planet passing in front of it, the planet will block, the solid surface of the planet will block the light from the star. But the atmosphere of the planet will also block the light of the star, but it'll preferentially block the light of the star in certain wavelengths corresponding to where the gas in that atmosphere absorbs light. So different gases like hydrogen and helium and oxygen and carbon absorb light at different specific different wavelengths that are predictable. And so if the planet looks a little bigger at those wavelengths, you know it must have say oxygen or water vapor. And so by looking at many such transits and looking where the planet is just a little bit bigger, we can say, oh yes, it has carbon dioxide or it has water or it has methane or, uh, or oxygen. Right? And that is, those are all very important molecules on, on Earth. Um, so for example, water is caused by, the water vapor is caused by evaporating oceans. Oxygen is, is caused by life. Carbon dioxide is a thermostat, comes from volcanoes. Methane comes from life as well. Um, and so these are either signatures that the planet is potentially habitable or even signatures that it might actually host life. And so, uh, so what you need in order to do this is you need to be able to monitor the star as the planet passes in front of it, take a spectrum of that star and look for uh, line, places in the spectrum where the planet looks a little bit bigger. Um, and then you can get a spec essentially a spectrum of the atmosphere of that planet. So first you have to find these systems. Now I already mentioned we have a number of candidates, tra the TRAPPIST system, we have, um, we have some Kepler systems, but then you have to get a big powerful telescope that operates in the infrared, so wavelengths longer than your eye can see, so you can actually try to get that spectrum by looking at the where the planet is bigger at certain wavelengths. And our, um, we're already doing this with HST, but it's not quite big enough. What we really need is a bigger telescope that works in the infrared. And fortunately, we're about to get one. So the James Webb Space Telescope, which has been um, being built now for over a decade, um, over almost two decades now, um, will, um, <clears throat> will be able to actually to make these observations. Um, and so, so James Webb is a six and a half meter telescope, whereas, um, whereas uh, 
HST is a 2.4 meter telescope, so it's quite a bit bigger than HST. Um, it because it's so big, it can't actually fit in the rocket, um, so it has to be folded up. Um, so these this mirror is actually unfolds, and you can see that it's it's looks like it's coated in gold here. That's because it is coated in gold. Gold is very very reflective in the infrared. So we have this enormous collecting area and this very cold telescope that allows us to make these very sensitive and exquisite observations. And this is a simulated spectrum of um, a hypothetical planet orbiting a low mass star um, after about 60 transits. Um, and so you can see we've the, the, these observations, these simulated observations have built up a spectrum and you can see the planet is bigger here. So when it goes up, the planet is bigger um, where you expect wavelengths of carbon dioxide. So that would indicate that this planet has carbon dioxide. Similarly, you can see ozone here, O3, um, some methane. And so you can get the fingerprint of this atmosphere and say, yes, this planet has the conditions needed to, to host life and maybe even has some biosignatures as well. So, um, so that's a very near future. And so stay tuned when uh, James Webb launches in, in December, uh, December 18th, it'll go through a roughly six month commissioning phase and then it'll start taking these, uh, taking observations and one of the first observations it's going to take is these kinds of transit observations to look for signatures of life. So stay tuned. Uh, and if you're curious, James Webb is now completely constructed. It's actually on a boat somewhere between California and French Guiana where it's going to be launched, although only a few people in the world know exactly which boat it's on because they're afraid space pirates are going to hijack it and hold it for ransom because it's worth about $10 billion. Um, so if you know where it is, don't tell your friends. Okay. But the other path is the pale blue dots. And this is the one I'm really excited about, partially because I've spent a fair amount of uh, time over the last five years working on a mission concept that can do this. So we would love to get an image like this of another Earth. That's not gonna happen anytime soon. We would love to even get an image like this, you know, a blurry pixelated image. That's not gonna happen anytime soon either. I'm like, when I say anytime soon, I'm like in the next few centuries. Um, but we could get an image like this, which is not too great. But this is actually an image of the Earth. It was taken by the Voyager spacecraft in roughly 1990. So Carl Sagan convinced the Voyager engineering team to take the space, Voyager spacecraft, turn it back around and point it towards the sun. They didn't want to do this because they're afraid to get some sunlight in there and break the telescope. But he convinced them to do it and they snapped this image. And what you see here, this is actually a, a scattered light in the telescope. So this is an optical illusion, but you see this pale blue dot. This is actually the, the reflected light of sunlight off of the Earth. So it's very fascinating to think that every one human being that was alive uh, when this picture was taken are in this one little pale blue dot. This dot is not even resolved, right? It doesn't, it, you don't even have multiple pixels across it. It's just one unresolved pale blue dot. And you might think, what could you possibly learn from that? I mean, look at this image. Um, and it turns out you can learn a lot. Um, but First, let's figure out how we're gonna get that image. And this is in really difficult, okay? So the earth is about 10 billion times fainter than the sun. Okay? Um, and it's located very close to the sun and the star uh, to, to uh, the sun. And if you're looking, at, if you were looking at the solar system from far away, right? The stars would be very far away. Stars are very far away from the sun. So the analogy people like to use is it's like trying to detect a firefly next to industrial searchlight like they have at Hollywood premieres when the firefly and the searchlight are in LA and you're standing in New York City. So that sounds impossibly challenging. And I was very curious about this analogy. So I went and looked up the luminosity of a firefly, which turns out to be not so easy. And then I went digging through owner's manuals of industrial searchlights to figure out the luminosity of a searchlight. And it turns out a firefly is about 10,000 times brighter compared to a searchlight than the earth is compared to the sun. So this problem of actually detecting these pale blue dots is about 10,000 times harder than even that terrifying analogy would apply. So never, nevertheless, though, we actually think we have a way to do it. And if we can take that, get that, and here, here's, the, here's the various ways we do it. So one is that we do what's, we use what's called a coronagraph. And a coronagraph is something that's inside of your telescope, and it's basically fancy optics. So what you really like to do is just put, hold your thumb or put a little dot in front of the star and let the planet's light pass through. Well, light doesn't behave very well um, because it's a wave, and so it actually ends up diffracting. Um, and it has imperfect wave fronts, so the waves are not well aligned. So if you try to do this, so here's an a, a animation showing some optics, and you just put a mask in, which should block off the light from the star and let the planet light pass through, 
you would think, there you go, that's fine. But like I said, if you, uh, if you, and so the planet light would pass and miss this block, this, this little, this little dot. And so you would think, well, you get planet light and no star starlight. But it turns out because light is doesn't well behaved and your waves coming in are not well aligned that you get this extra residual light from the star that's much brighter than the planet. But using fancy optics in particular a deformable mirror that will straighten out the waves from the light, you can further suppress the starlight and lo and behold out pops your planet. Right? So this is a method that is really nice because you just put it in your telescope, it requires fancy optics in your telescope, but it allows you to detect the planet light. The other technique, which I really love because it's just really cool, is called a star shade. And here in a star shade, it's very much like, you know, putting your thumb over the sun, right? Except here your thumb is basically it's a, a petal shaped uh, star shade, which is the size of a baseball diamond. The trick here, of course, is you can't launch a baseball diamond. So you have to use techniques of origami to fold it up and then it has to unfold perfectly once it gets out into space. And this thing has to be 100,000 um, miles away from your, um, from your telescope itself um, in order to get the right, uh, block the light from the, the star, but not the light from the planet. But if you do that, then you don't have to have a fancy telescope or a chronograph at all, because you're just blocking the light from the star. It never enters your telescope and you get light from the planet. So these are the two techniques we have. And actually, if you do both, they're better than the sum of their parts. Um, and so if you can then detect this pale blue dot, and then you can take it and divide it up into its component wavelengths, you might see something that looks like this. So this is actually a, a spectrum of the earth. Um, and you see all these very interesting features. Wherever the, the, this goes down, that means there's less light, up there's more light. And so one thing you see is the amount of light rises towards the left here, which is towards shorter wavelengths. This is optical, infra, visible infrared, and near infrared. So the, the amount of light reflected by this, the planet increases to shorter wavelengths. And that's, be, that's because the planet is blue. And the reason why a planet is blue is the same reason the sky is blue, is because the stuff in the atmosphere scatters sunlight better at shorter wavelengths than larger wavelengths. But you also see these deep troughs. These are due to things like water vapor, or carbon dioxide, or methane or even oxygen. And so these are signatures that maybe the planet is habitable because it has carbon dioxide and water vapor, and maybe it's inhabited because it has oxygen and methane. So even though this pale blue dot image doesn't look very impressive, if we can divide it up into its component wavelengths, then we can actually see whether or not this planet is potentially habitable and maybe even find evidence of life. So, um, so th that's the basic idea. Now, of course, you have to build an entire mission concept around this, and these missions are not trivial for obvious reasons. And so um, about in 2016, NASA commissioned two studies to study mission concepts that would in part be able to detect and characterize and take spectra of pale blue dots to look for potentially habitable planets and signs of life. And so um, I was actually co-chair of one of these mission concept studies along with Sarah Seeger at MIT. That's called the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory. Um, this is a relatively diminutive telescope, about four meters, so still bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, but not as big as James Webb. But it would have a 52-meter star shade, roughly the size of a baseball diamond. And it would have an internal coronagraph as well. So it's using the best of both of those technologies to suppress the starlight so we can detect the pale blue dot and take its spectrum. Um, and then the other was a much more ambitious concept called Louvoir. Um, this is more like the size of uh, 40, meet, 40 feet or something like that, a much bigger telescope largest telescope in the optical ever commissioned in space by far, it would also have to fold up because it wouldn't fit in the rocket. Um, and it would have this enormous sun shield to keep it uh, cool and the scattered light away. Um, and so they, and they studied two different mission concepts. So these concepts were developed over the course of about four and a half years to, um, to very, very in a great detail. So not only did we develop the science case, we actually like had master parts lists for these telescopes, which of course weren't even being constructed. Um, and that's so that we could get accurate estimates of how much these telescopes would cost and figure out what technologies needed to be developed to make them actually happen. So that if, they're, if NASA chooses to do one of these missions, that they have a viable path forward to making sure these missions happen on time, on schedule and actually work. Um, so um, these are sort of some simulated images of what these telescopes might see. This is a solar system at about 10 light years um, using this 40 foot telescope, 
This is Luar. So you can see Earth very clearly. The star here has been suppressed by the coronagraph. You see Venus, and then you see Jupiter. And of course, you could take spectrum of all these dots and see what their constituents are of their atmosphere. This is an image uh, for simulated for Habex. Again, this is a 13 foot telescope, much smaller, 170 foot star shade. Um, and this is a system at 30 light years. And you can see a number of different planets here. And you can even see a dust disk. And one of these planets is actually very similar to the Earth. Um, so that, that's the kind of things we could see. So we could see sort of complete family portraits of nearby planetary systems. And if we could take their spectrum, then this might be what we'd see. So this is roughly a 350 hour spectrum. So that's a lot of time, but that's what these telescopes are designed to do um, with, for a system at about, uh, about four, four or five light years away from the Earth, a hypothetical system. This is an Earth-like planet. And again, you can see the rise of flux towards the blue here. That's due to uh, Raleigh scattering. That's why our sky is blue. You can see the absorption line due to oxygen here, absorption lines due to water. And then you see this very sharp absorption line here. So the planet is almost black at wavelengths shorter than our eyes can see. That's due to ozone. And it's the reason why, you know, the reason why we don't get fried to a crisp every time we walk outside and the sun is out. Um, it's because the ozone absorbs these short wavelengths photons, which would otherwise give us very severe sunburns in a very short amount of time. And since ozone is just three atoms of oxygen, then um, having a lot of ozone indicates you have a lot of oxygen, which again, all oxygen on Earth comes from life. Um, so this is a potential biosignature. Um, and of course, we're not so naive as to think that, um, you know, we're going to see Earth exactly like they look right now. The Earth's atmosphere itself actually evolved over time. Um, and so in the past, um, we had much more methane, for example, and we had a hydrocarbon hazes. Um, that's in the Archean Earth. Um, and, uh, and then the Protozoic Earth. We had much less oxygen than we have now, the oxygen built over time. So the spectrum of the Earth has changed over the course of its history. And, but yet it was inhabited that entire time and, there, and by definition habitable. So we wanna be able to be sensitive to all the different kinds of Earths over cosmic time so that we're sensitive to all the different kinds of conditions of habitable planets and potentially in, um, habitability. Um, okay. So how many planets can we expect to, that we'll be able to detect, that these pale blue dots we can detect and then get their spectrum? Well, the Louvoir being a much more ambitious mission with a large, larger aperture telescope can detect many more of them. So if uh, according to the frequencies of Earth-like planets that we estimate based on the results from Kepler, we think that Louvoir would be able to detect about 50 over the five-year mission lifetime and get their spectra. HabX would be much more diminutive, it would be roughly eight. But again, even if just one of these happens to have habitable, shows the signs of habitable conditions and life, then that would be obviously a huge game changer for, you know, for, you know, history. Uh, it would be a big deal. Um, so what now? Are we going to do these missions or not? This is the, you know, $10 billion question. It's roughly how much these missions would cost. Um, and uh, the answer is we don't know, but we're going to find out very soon. So here I'll tell you a little bit about how the sausage is made when um, you might ask, you know, how did we decide to do the James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble Space Telescope? How does NASA decide to do these telescopes? Who makes that decision? And why does Congress fund it? Those kinds of things. Well, the answer is what's called decadal surveys. So every 10 years, roughly, astronomers get together and they appoint a, you know, a bunch of, of high profile astronomers that are the, the, the experts in their field. Um, and, uh, and those astronomers get together, they solicit a bunch of input from the entire astronomical community, not just the US, but worldwide. And they um, sit down and they think for a long time based on that input on what uh, they think US astronomy should do for the next 10 years. And this is not just space-based astronomy, which I'm focusing on here, but also ground-based astronomy and, um, and things like how much money should be going to grants to fund uh, individual astronomers, graduate student postdocs. Um, and typically, one of the main results from these surveys is that they prioritize a list of large space missions. And they say, this is the number one priority for a large space mission, which NASA often calls a flagship mission. And so um, here, in each one of these decadal surveys, the telescope that was actually prioritized is, is listed here. So Hubble was prioritized all the way back in 1972. Um, that was in the, in the 1972 decadal survey. The Chandra X-ray telescope was in 82. Um, 
Spitzer was in 91, James at Webb was in 2001, and in 2010, the Roman Space Telescope, <clears throat> which I'm also heavily involved in, was prioritized. And that, that telescope is now being constructed as we speak. Um, it should be launched in 2027. So um, what's gonna be the next? So you might notice that we are now in 2021. So you know we should be getting the 2020 Decadal Survey coming out any time now. And in fact, 2020 Decadal Survey has been going on for over a year. Um, and they're just, they're, they're, um, they're, they've taken all their input um, and, and are trying to prioritize what should be done. And as part of this process, these four mission concepts were studied. I already mentioned two of these. These were commissioned in 2016. I mentioned the Louvoir and HabEx. I was involved in HabEx. But there were two others. One is an X-ray telescope, and one is a far infrared telescope. And so these four large mission concepts, which all would cost somewhere between 4 or $5 billion and up to maybe $15 billion, um, were studied for four and a half years in an amazing level of rigor and detail, and then submitted to the 2020 Decadal Survey and presented to that survey as input as possible large missions that they could prioritize. Um, and so now they're thinking about it. We don't know, well, they know, but they're being very, uh, very um, secretive about what their priorities are. And this is actually super important because NASA and the National Science Foundation uh, and the Department of Energy are, they follow these recommendations very strictly. Um, so these are really the priorities that the astronomical community says, this is what we should do. And so if a large, one of these large mission concepts is prioritized, NASA will make every effort to start development as soon as possible and try to launch this thing um, in sometime in the next decade. So um, we don't know what's gonna happen. Okay. We don't know what the 2020 Decadal Survey is going to say. Maybe it will prioritize one of these, maybe two of them, maybe none of them. We don't know. Hopefully not none of them. So we wait, but not much longer. So rumors have been flying around for the last three months about when this is going to come out, right? And those of us that have invested a lot of time in the input are really, 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 you know, getting a little antsy about we really want to know the answer. So current rumor is sometime in the beginning of November, this result is going to come out. And so uh, I encourage you to start paying attention because there'll be some announcements in a few weeks beforehand that'll let you know that it's going to happen. Um, and if you happen to catch the press release where they announce what the priorities are, listen for something about HabEx or Louvoir. And if they say something about that, then you'll know that these missions that we, that NASA will be planning on doing one of these missions and maybe in the next decade will actually have evidence for potentially habitable planets and evidence for life on those planets. Uh, so that's a very exciting time. So we're in very ex exciting time in human history. So for the first time, we can begin to answer this question, is there life in the universe in a scientific manner? And we've broken that down into four sub-questions. We've already answered three of those four in the positive. We're working on looking for such signatures of habitable conditions in life. So um, I was part of a National Academy of Sciences exoplanet science strategy report that laid out the priorities for exoplanets, which then was input to the 2020 Decadal Survey. And we had a couple of nice pithy quotes. One was the search for life on other worlds is both a profound and profoundly difficult endeavor. It's a great quote. I like this one better. It's a little more wordy, but I like it better partially because I wrote it. So generations, humans looked up in the uh, sky and wondered, uh, uh, is there life out there? That question unites us. It is unknown whether or not this generation will be the first to learn that life is common throughout the galaxy or the first to discern hints of cosmic loneliness. What we do know is that we can be the first with the technological and scientific ability to answer this question if we so choose. And I would argue we should so, should so choose. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gowdy, for that amazing talk. Um, and now we are entering the Q&A session. So we'll be taking questions from the audience. So feel free to post all your questions in the Q&A chat. And there's already uh, a few questions. So I'm gonna start with uh, the first one, which is from Summer McLean. Um, they ask, uh, uh, this might be silly, but would a planet need to be like ours to have life? Couldn't other organisms operate by different rules than organisms do on Earth? Uh, like maybe they would not need water uh, to live. So not not a silly question at all. Um, it's, you know, obviously we don't want to be too, um, 
too biased in, in what we're looking for. Um, people have thought about life that operates by different rules. So for example, it's life that's based on silicon, not carbon, or life that uses a different solvent like ammonia rather than water. Um, but there's a variety of reasons why carbon-based life that uses water as a solvent is, is natural. One is that the two elements that like to come, uh, two most abundant elements that actually like to play with other elements are hydrogen and oxygen, which are obviously the basis of water. Water is actually liquid at a very large range of temperatures, much larger than something like ammonia. And carbon is the third most abundant element that likes to play well with other elements. Uh, and it forms very unique structures like uh, there's a whole branch of chemistry obviously called organic, organic chemistry. And so for example, carbon and oxygen form CO2, or carbon dioxide, Silicon and oxygen form SiO2, which is also known as sand, not super useful for life. So there's a variety of reasons that why carbon and water might be, um, might be the, the preferred pathway, but we should definitely not be too close-minded about that. Thank you uh, for your answer. Um, uh, someone else asks, if a planet was found with life and wasn't as advanced as us, do you think we should make ourselves known or keep our distance? Uh, so I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a moralist. <laughs> um, uh, so one thing I would say is I think that the probability that we would find life that is less advanced than us is probably pretty low um, just because, uh, well, there's lots of factors that go into that, but it might be pretty low. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I would say that the, the, the likely outcome is either we find simple microbial life um, or we don't find anything at all. That would be my guess. Um, and so, you know, should we go and we should we go and try to land on a planet that has microbial life? Probably not. And there's uh, similar arguments to say why we shouldn't land on Europa um, or try to d d drill into the ice of Europa, because if there's actually ecosystem under Europa's ice sheath, then we might actually destroy that ecosystem because we're coming in with, with you know, different uh, bacteria or viruses or something that might do that. So, so there's a lot of moral questions there, but it's not really my field, um, but it's something I think really should be thought of very carefully um, before doing any kind of in-situ exploration of other, other worlds. And it is thought about very carefully, just not by me. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, so there's another question. Uh, Abdul asks, how well do different countries collaborate for the 10-year surveys? Oh, so yeah, uh, they collaborate. So ESA, the European Space Agency, has a different uh, model. They have a longer-term plan. Uh, so they just finished their Voyage 2050 plan. Um, so it's a longer term than just 10 years. But yeah, in general, these missions are, are getting to the scale of complexity and have been for a while, really, such that they really aren't should not be and aren't just the province of one country or uh, you know, just e e the EU or just the United States. So for example, the James Webb Space Telescope, the Europeans and Canadians are very are large partners in the James Webb Space Telescope, so much so that the Europeans are actually providing the launch rocket and um, the launch site for James Webb Space Telescope. Any one of these four mission concepts I mentioned, mentioned um, we, we had international participants in the studies and the, it, we would obviously do this with in coordination with international partners. And they've already expressed interest in all four of these missions. If one of them is prioritized, um, ESA has expressed interest in getting involved as is JAXA, um, Canadian Space Agency, et cetera. So yeah, these are, these are international endeavors. These are human questions, not American questions. Excellent. Um, someone else asked, uh, uh, if put in operation, how many exoplanets are the telescopes targeted to survey? Um, and also, are there any exoplanetary systems that are of particular interest right now in the search for life? So it, the number of systems that you can target depends a lot on the specific telescope that you're talking about. So James Webb Space Telescope will probably target a few dozens for the intense observations I mentioned. It'll look at, or maybe a dozen for the intense observations I mentioned. It'll look at a larger number of bigger planets that are easier to characterize, but not likely to be habitable. Um, and for and so for HabEx, it's you know a few hundred, of which maybe ten are uh, Earth-like planets. For Louvoir, it's a few, it's several hundred, many hundreds, uh, of which maybe fifty are potentially Earth-like. Um, so it really depends on the systems that you're talking about. And what was the other part of the question? Um, I think, what are some of the systems that are interesting in the search for life right now? Oh, TRAPPIST is, is probably the number one most interesting system that people talk about a lot. 
um, because it has three potentially habitable planets and uh, for a variety of reasons uh, lends itself to characterization very well. Excellent. Um, D. Roth asks, given the anti-science bias of what could be a majority of the federal le legislature, is there a danger that these missions will be defunded? So, of course, there, I mean, they first, have, first they have to be funded. <laughs> Just because NASA says they want to do them doesn't mean Congress is going to give money, because every year NASA has to renegotiate its budget with, Nat with um, Congress. Um, and, you know, we can argue the pros and cons of that, of that system, but that's the system we have. Um, and so every year NASA, you know, astrophysics division can have its budget cut by half if Congress wants to. Uh, and in fact, the Roman Space Telescope, which I mentioned that I've been involved with, was cut three times by the previous administration, like canceled three times, all three times Congress restored the funding. So yes, this is, this is part of the political, um, the political struggle of, of balancing science priorities versus all the other priorities of what we're trying to do as a nation. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the questions of what's, what should be funded and what shouldn't, but, um, but these are obviously some of the considerations because you know, at the end of the day, we only have so much money to spend on these kinds of endeavors. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, there's one from William Wilking. Uh, they ask, it seems that we have now uh, some of the probabilities of the Drake equations, uh, which do we know fairly well, and what is the resulting partial probability, and which factors are known at this point? Okay, so you're going to force me to remember the terms of the Drake equation. Uh, so the one is the star formation rate, uh, which we know quite well. Uh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the star formation rate, we know quite well. So the, then there's a fraction of stars that have planets that we know pretty well. The number of Earth-like planets that could support life. Again, that's the third question I talked about. Yeah, maybe we know something like that. The rest of them uh, are basically completely unknown at this point. They're unconstrained. The biggest one for me, and this is really the reason why I think the Drake equation is so uncertain in terms of its, its how useful it is to predict, you know, the number of civilizations which we can communicate is the last, which is the length of time that civilizations can exist. Um, there are various reasons to be super pessimistic about how long this, this could be. I mean, we could be nearing the end of our uh, communicating civilization right now in, in our case. Um, but, you know, if we survive, uh, as Jodie Foster says in Contact, our uh, cosmic adolescence, technological adolescence, then maybe we'll make it for 100,000 years. So, um, so, you know, I, the Drake equation is not is, is a way of formulating our ignorance and, and, and compartmentalizing our ignorance. Is it actually useful in predicting things? Not really, um, but, uh, but it helps us to frame the, the question in the same way I broke down those, the question of are we alone into the four questions. I would say that when I'm talking about are we alone, I'm talking about is there simple cell, simple organisms on other planets? I wasn't talking about communicating intelligent civilizations and where all those other terms come in. Excellent. Um, James Tyler asked, um, I saw a presentation on dark matter, which we detect uh, by its gravitational effects. Do you have to take into account in the uh, detection methods you described? No, dark matter is not important on, for any of the systems that I was talking about today. Um, dark matter operates on much larger scales in general. Um, so none of the systems we I was talking about contain a significant amount of dark matter. Um, so there's a question that is more, um, more personal. Um, Madeleine asks, can you share a little bit about why you chose Ohio State to study astronomy and come back as a faculty member? Uh, well, because Ohio State's awesome. <laughs> um, no, uh, so um, the graduate program at Ohio State, and maybe maybe Romy could back me up on this, is is a really good program. It's one of the top ten of programs in the country. Um, and when I got here as a graduate student back in 1995, it was an amazingly nurturing environment. Um, I really grew. Um, you know, I wasn't even sure I was going to be a very good astronomer, or I was going to even like research when I started here. And um, by the time I finished, I knew this is my passion, what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew I could do it. Um, and, um, and I just love the department. I love it. It's, it's very interactive, or at least it was pre-pandemic. Um, it's very interactive. People talk. We have morning coffee every, every day at 1030, where we talk about the latest science results. Um, 
And, uh, and it's just a great place to be an astronomer. And um, so when I left, it's kind of sad. Well, I love Columbus too. Um, and when I left, I was kind of sad because I, you know, most graduate programs don't hire back their faculty, their graduate students as faculty, but um, I was fortunate enough to get an offer from Iowa State in 2006. And so I came back. And so it was a no brainer for me. I would, this was my dream job to come back to. Thank you. And I agree with everything you said. It's a <laughs> great program and a great department. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Robert Taylor asks, what is the most interesting or surprising planetary system you have discovered? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, so the, the one that's the, the, the one that's my, you know, my, my baby is called Kelp 9b. Um, it is a gas giant planet on a, um, a forgetting one and a half day orbit. Uh, and it has a day side temperature that's hotter than most stars. Um, even though it's a giant planet. And so it's so hot that there's no molecules um, on the day side, they're all disassociated. Um, and it has like iron vapor in the atmosphere on the day side. It's just super weird. Um, and it really stands out amongst all the giant planets. It's a archetype of what's known as an ultra hot Jupiter. Um, so that that is the weirdest thing I've ever been involved with in terms of discovery. There's a lot of weird planets out there though, I have to say. So that just happens to be the one that I was involved with. It's the weirdest, I think. Awesome, thank you. Um, someone else asks, NASA's SETI program was defunded, but the search for life has had a resurgence in the search for biosignatures. Should there be NSF funding for radio signals or laser pulses, or is that too X-Files-like? Uh, yes, there should be. NSF funding for radio signals and laser pulses, because man, as I think Jill Tarter says, if we don't, if we, if they were sending us signals and we just weren't paying attention, that would be super frustrating. <laughs> um, so I think of this as, um, I, you know, as a, in a kind of portfolio sense of investment is you should have a diverse portfolio. So you should spend most of your um, funding on things that are, you know, clearly going to make some uh, clear progress going forward, but you should always spend part of your uh, funding and exactly what fraction I think is a matter of personal taste on things that are high risk, high reward, um, things that maybe have a low probability of success, but if they do would be completely transformative. If we actually saw a signal from SETI or optical set, radio SETI or optical SETI um, that was due to an intelligent civilization, I mean, that would change everything. Um, and if, and of, of course it would just automatically answer, is there life out there? Yes, yes there is. And it's, some of it's intelligent. So um, yeah, I mean, and it doesn't cost us very much. You know, SETI is not expensive really in the grand scheme of things. So I think absolutely we should be doing it, yeah. And I will say that, you know, when I started as a graduate student, even the search for planets was considered a little fringe. Like, why are you spending your career on searching for planets? That's weird. Um, and, uh, and now it's very, very mainstream. Um, so, yeah. so, and again, and similarly, this astrobiology wasn't even considered a real science and now it's a, now it's a real thing. So, yeah. Okay. Well, um, we are close to the hour, but, um, we have time for one last quick question. So I wanted to end it on a lighter note. Um, someone asks what work of fiction that involves outer space do you enjoy the most? Do you have any sci-fi? Uh, oh gosh. So, I mean, I have to go with contact. I, that book changed my whole way of looking at the search for life. Um, I just think it's a great book. If you haven't, if you've seen the movie, the movie's great. I love the movie. Read the book though. If you haven't read, read the book, it's, it's fantastic. And the ending is just mind blowing. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering questions and for the great talk. Um, this, thank, ends thank you, the, <laughs> this ends the Q and A session. Um, All right. Thanks everyone.